Is there any chance that the classic lineup of KISS will ever get back together again? Just how deep is the bad blood between the Gallagher brothers? When you're in a rock band, tensions tend to run high. Nobody knows drama more than Metallica. And by extension, so do their fellow thrash metal peers Megadeth. Current Megadeth frontman Dave Mustaine was originally the lead guitar player in Metallica. It didn't last long, though. Everyone in Metallica drank heavily, which earned them the nickname Alcoholica. As for Mustaine, he's described himself as a violent drunk. As he admitted to Loudwire, I lost all inhibitions when I was drinking, and that didn't go over too well in the end. On April 11, 1983, Frontman James Hetfield and drummer Lars Ulrich gave Mustaine a bus ticket and told him he was out of the band. Kirk Hammett had already been hired to replace him. Itching for vengeance, Mustaine went on to form Megadeth with the goal of rivaling Metallica. They would never quite match his former band's success, but at 50 million records sold, it's hard to argue that Mustaine didn't at least mount an impressive comeback. Still, tensions persisted. Mustaine was infamously bitter for decades, even complaining about it to Ulrich in a therapy session, as seen in Metallica's Some Kind of Monster documentary. Good God, man, I didn't get a, I didn't get a chance. They weren't called the Toxic Twins for nothing. Singer Steven Tyler and guitarist Joe Perry of Aerosmith had an appetite for drugs that rivals anyone in music history. Combine that with a grueling touring schedule, and you're in a world of trouble. That's exactly where the band found itself on July 28, 1979. As Perry admitted in an interview with Biography, we were pretty burned out, and instead of taking a vacation, we let loose on each other. It started when Joe's wife Alyssa got into a fight backstage with bassist Tom Hamilton's wife Terry. Then Tom and Joe, and eventually Tyler, got involved as well, and it all unraveled from there. The fight ultimately led to Perry making the decision to leave the group. He would return a few years later, and the band would go on to enjoy massive success in the decades to come, but the tension never fully went away. Sobriety and maturity certainly helped them achieve a better working relationship, but there's still been talk recently of Perry wanting Tyler replaced, as per Ultimate Classic Rock. Great artists tend to clash a lot. That's definitely the case with Pink Floyd's David Gilmour and Roger Waters. Gilmour joined the group in 1968 and saw his influence grow until he and Waters were in open war for creative control. By 1985, the situation had become untenable, and Waters left the band. But the story wasn't over. Waters and Gilmour also sparred in courtrooms, due to the former insisting that the band break up in his absence. Gilmour and drummer Nick Mason fought back, contending that they were still trying to make new music. In a 2013 interview with the BBC, Waters admitted he was wrong, but the tension had persisted through the years. As Waters put it in a video shared on Twitter in 2020, David thinks he owns the band's website. I think he thinks that I'm irrelevant and I should just keep my mouth shut. I think he thinks that because I left the band in 1985, that he owns Pink Floyd, that he is Pink Floyd. Waters also lamented that Gilmore's wife, Polly, was permitted to use the site to sell her books while he couldn't use it to promote music. For his part, Mason thinks it's all a bit immature. As he told Rolling Stone in 2018, it's really disappointing that these rather elderly gentlemen are still at loggerheads. For a band known for its upbeat tunes, Blink-182 sure have had their fair share of tragedy and drama. In 1998, original drummer Scott Raynor was fired from the band. There were conflicting accounts of his departure, but his heavy drinking likely had something to do with it. He was replaced by Travis Barker, who enjoyed massive fame with the band, but it hasn't always been easy. In 2001, singer-guitarist Tom DeLonge didn't want to pay for a studio drummer for his side project, Boxcar Racer, so he asked Barker to join him. Barker obliged, but singer-bassist Mark Hoppus was hurt. As DeLonge recalled to MTV, it was really hard for Mark. He thought it was really lame Travis and I went and did that. Then, in 2005, DeLong left the band, citing the members' differing priorities. Blink-182 was then on indefinite hiatus. They reconnected after Barker survived a plane crash and reunited the band in 2009, but the only album they released during this period underperformed. By 2015, DeLong was again out of the band, focusing more on his other group, Angels and Airwaves. Barker then put DeLong on blast, as he told Rolling Stone, 
Why Blink even got back together in the first place is questionable. KISS were one of the biggest bands of the 1970s, but by the end of the decade, audiences had grown wise to their act. Drummer Peter Criss apparently felt the same way, as he left the band in May 1980. Well, that's his version of the story, anyway. According to frontman Paul Stanley and bassist Gene Simmons, Chris was fired. Lead guitarist Ace Fraley followed Chris out the door the following year. Fraley discussed the band's history during a 2020 appearance on the Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon podcast. As he put it, in 1981, Gene was over-merchandising the band. They wanted to tour constantly. I didn't want to tour. I wanted to drive my sports cars and hang out with my friends in between. They were workaholics, and I wanted to go to Studio 54 and enjoy my stardom. Chris and Fraley have rejoined the band a few times, though it's never lasted, and Bad Blood still runs deep. As Simmons told Guitar World in 2019, Ace and Peter have gotten three chances. They were in and out of the band, fired three times. For drugs, alcohol, bad behavior, being unprofessional, they weren't carrying their load. We'd love to have Ace and Peter join us here and there, and if they don't, it's not going to be because of us. But they're never going to be in KISS again. Fraley responded by calling Stanley and Simmons names and even accusing Simmons of inappropriate behavior towards his wife. Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham were a package deal ever since high school. The musician couple joined the ranks of Fleetwood Mac in 1975 and boosted the group to massive success with one of the decade's best-selling albums, 1977's Rumors. That record is a notorious sonic chronicle of unraveling romantic entanglements. Nix and Buckingham had just broken up with each other. Christine McVie and John McVie were separating, and Mick Fleetwood was getting a divorce. Many of the songs were autobiographical in nature, as they zeroed in on these tumultuous relationships, mostly Nix and Buckingham's. Despite this baggage, the band managed to tour together throughout the 80s, but by the early 90s, they couldn't do it any longer. In 1994, Nix spoke to Rolling Stone and said of Buckingham, We're really not friends, really not anything. We did not break up friends, and we have never been friends since. Reunions have happened in the years since, but time can't heal all wounds, as Buckingham was fired from the group in 2018. Unsurprisingly, his and Nick's accounts of exactly what happened differ substantially. As far as you're concerned, you're not in the band because of Stevie. That was what I was told by Irving that she gave them an ultimatum. With hits like Take It Easy, Take It to the Limit, and Hotel California, the Eagles are one of the most successful American rock bands of all time. But backstage, things weren't always as mellow as their infectious harmonies. The recording of their 1979 album, The Long Run, was reportedly a painful, exhausting process. In 1980, the band was playing a benefit concert for California Senator Alan Cranston. According to Ultimate Classic Rock, when he thanked the band backstage, guitarist Don Felder mumbled, You're welcome, Senator, I guess. Glenn Fry was enraged at the remark, so he confronted Felder, who then threatened to fight him after they finished their set. Soon thereafter, Fry knew that he had to leave the band, and this wasn't the only altercation. Their huge success in the 70s, thanks in particular to Hotel California, put immense pressure on the band. As Felder put it to Ultimate Classic Rock in 2013, when nerves get worn really thin and frayed, that's when people say things, do things, misbehave, especially when you add fuel to the fire with drugs and alcohol. It just becomes a very volatile situation. Van Halen's 1984 album propelled the band to new heights of commercial success, but trouble was brewing backstage. In 1985, original frontman David Lee Roth was out of the band due to infighting and creative differences. He later remarked, according to Louder Sound, the band had disintegrated into a spiteful bunch of bleary-eyed, argumentative, procrastinating individuals. Meanwhile, the remaining members mocked Roth's departure, with Eddie Van Halen telling Rolling Stone, Dave left to be a movie star. Roth was replaced with Sammy Hagar, who saw great success with the band in the late 80s, but the good times were short-lived. By June 1996, Hagar was out of the band, citing creative differences and a need to spend more time with his family as reasons for the departure. He rejoined the band for a 2004 reunion tour, but it was reportedly marred by sloppy performances and substance abuse. Neither Hagar nor longtime bassist Michael Anthony ever played with Van Halen again, but they were the only two who bothered to attend the band's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. 
as Eddie Van Halen was in rehab and Roth couldn't come to an agreement about what to sing. The bad blood between longtime Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose and top-hatted guitar hero Slash ran deep for decades. In hindsight, it's amazing that the classic lineup held on for as long as it did. As detailed by Ultimate Classic Rock, in 1989, Rose threatened to break up the group on stage unless his bandmates got a handle on their drug use. Both Slash and bassist Duff McKagan admitted to being embarrassed and angry. The following year, drummer Steven Adler was fired for his own drug addiction. Then, in 1991, rhythm guitarist Izzy Stradlin, newly sober and unable to handle the madness, abruptly quit the band. The behemoth Use Your Illusion tour lumbered on, but according to Spin, it was fraught with controversy stemming from rampant substance abuse and Rose often taking to the stage hours late. In some instances, his mid-set storm-offs even led to riots. In the mid-90s, GNR covered the Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil, but it was reportedly such a difficult process that Slash quit the band. Matters weren't helped much by Rose demanding that his remaining bandmates sign over all rights to the band's name to him. For the next several years, the fight played out in the press, with Rose calling Slash a cancer. Despite all this, the band reunited in 2016 for their Not In This Lifetime reunion tour, which was named after an earlier Rose quote describing the improbability of such a thing ever happening. Granted, the negative stuff uh, existed and, and might still exist or whatever. Between Champagne Supernova and Wonderwall, Britpop duo Oasis gave us some of the best alternative rock songs of the mid-90s, but they're also just as famous for their legendary infighting. As reported by Far Out Magazine, the sibling rivalry can be traced all the way back to a rough, often violent upbringing at the hands of an abusive father that led the Gallagher brothers to deal with the trauma in unhealthy ways. Liam was a rambunctious loudmouth, while his older brother Noel tended to turn his anger inward. Neither knew how to put up with the other, making for a tumultuous working relationship. According to Rolling Stone, in 1994, a botched set resulted in Liam smashing a tambourine on Noel's head and storming off. Then, in 1996, at the height of the band's fame, Liam skipped a show so he could heckle Noel from a balcony. Four years later, during a particularly heinous backstage blowout, Liam reportedly accused Noel's daughter of being born out of wedlock prompting Noel to quit the band, if only temporarily. In a 2005 interview with Spin Magazine, Noel bragged about gaslighting and manipulating his brother to get what he wanted. Then, in 2009, Noel quit the band permanently, and by 2011, both brothers were trading shots via Twitter that have continued for years. We don't like each other, man. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite musicians are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.